That's good. That's good. Before I came out here, uh, Nate said, I don't know if he said it just a minute ago. I wasn't fully listening to him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like usual. Oh, no, just kidding. No, he said, he said, man, that was awfully good when I came off last service. That was awfully good. And on my head, I'm like, was it awful or was it good? I don't know if it can be awfully good. I don't even know what that means. That's, that's one of those oxymorons, you know. Uh, it just seems like the wrong two words, they're not supposed to go together. You know, there's a bunch of these words out here. Y'all might have heard a few of them, like a fine mess. I don't get that one. Is it fine or is it a mess? I mean, make up your mind. It's got to be one or the other. It's a little big. You know, ladies like to say, what's well, a little big? It's a little big. No, nah, it's really big. <laughs> it's ginormous. How about a jumbo shrimp? That always feels like a weird one to me. Well, is it jumbo or is it a shrimp? I don't know. You got to pick one or the other one. How about a minor miracle? I don't think a miracle's ever been minor. I mean, in just my humble opinion, they all seem pretty big. They don't make any sense. When you, t when you think about an oxymoron, you put two words together, a lot of times it don't make sense. But there's other ones, even ones that I think are even better that are all self-contained in themselves, you know, like abbreviation. It's a really long word. And I'm just saying, if you, shouldn't you abbreviate, abbreviate? You know, I'm just thinking, how about phonics is not spelled the way that it is, right? It's like, that doesn't even make any sense. Who wrote, you know, come up with a better word, right? Uh, and then, of course, there's like, act, just listen, just act naturally. I don't want you to be natural. I want you to act like you're natural. Doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the most, uh, the greatest contradiction, the greatest oxymoron in the history of mankind, and I'm sure we're all going to agree with this right here, the greatest one of all time, country music. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> no, nobody? A lot of people are like, listen here, you're going to, I'll just kill you right now. <laughs> I'm just saying, if your country, can you be smart enough to actually write music? I don't know. I'm just pontificating a little bit. <laughs> I, know. I know. Oh, mercy. I'm going to be killed after this. Um, I just, anyway, I'm going to stop. I got so many things I want to say. Stop right here. The pen is mightier than the sword. See, here's the thing. Somebody with a pen wrote that one. Because all, all I'm saying is, let's give it a shot. <laughs> I'll take the sword, you take the pen. Let's see how this works out for you. I feel great about my chances. I mean, I feel really good about my chances. But here's what's interesting. Would you not agree with me? Would you not agree with me that in the history of mankind, the pen has killed more people than the sword? So isn't it weird Something that you put together that looks completely contradictory, that makes no sense. Oxymoron. They can be also true. Contradictions aren't always what they appear to be. Now, I say that because today we have one of these weird contradictions. Our question, we're kind of looking at all of these difficult questions that Christians kind of struggle with. And today's is a very popular one. It's been struggled with, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years. And it appears at first glance to be one of these oxymorons. Here's the question, you ready? How could a loving God send good people to hell? It's, it's, it seems kind of strange, but just here on the onset, here's what I want you to do with me, all right? Go here with me just for a minute. Is it possible that just like these other statements, that just because it appears to be an oxymoron, a contradiction, that there might be truth in it nonetheless? So I just want to start from this premise because this is a, a very popular struggle with many people and, and I want to dig down on it. Before I jump too far in it, I want to set it up with a text. It's a scripture. The most famous text of all time is John 3.16 in my opinion. It's sort of become, you know, the poster child for the, for the Bible. And it does. It is a great representative. If you were going to nail down the entire scripture, that's probably a good one. 
And so we'll look at John chapter three, verse 16, but I wanna look at some of the verses afterwards. I have underlined, these are not in the original writings. I've underlined some key phrases in here that if you wanna underline these or to write them to the side as notes, uh, and we'll come back towards the end and kind of hit some of these. All right, so let's look, John three sixteen through 19. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is already condemned or condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So let's go back to our question of the day. Question of the day, how could a loving God send good people to hell? I wanna look at that first, uh, the first issue that I wanna come into is looking at that phrase, good people. It just stands out to me as probably the most important thing. We gotta figure out what is good people? What is good people? Um, and here's the problem. So it's not, I think for a lot of us, we say, well, it's not a, a Jew that gets in. It's not a Christian, it's not a Muslim. It's a good Jew or it's a good Christian or it's a good Muslim that gets in. Some of us are like, eh, we don't need all those. You're putting titles on it. It's not really necessary. At the end of the day, what we just really need is some good people. If you're a good person, then that's really all that matters. Because some of us, we have that thought process. It's not really the path that you take is not necessary. It's, it's, it's if you're, how you take the path is what's necessary, right? Not which way that's gonna get you there, just get there in a good way. Now, let's take a test. I'll give you a little test. These are always fun. Let me ask you this question. When you think about this, why do you think that you are going to go to heaven? Just ponder that for a minute. What, what is gonna get you into heaven? I'll let you struggle with that for a minute. Let me tell you some of the answers that I hear quite a bit. Now, from a religious perspective, especially growing up, you know, I grew up in a backwoods Southern Baptist church, phrases like, well, I go to church, I've been baptized, I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart, my soul, you know, a lot of those. So there's this religious element that you'll sometimes hear. But then you'll hear other people that, as you kind of broaden it out a little bit, people are like, well, um, I think that I, I am a good, and they'll fill in the blank, they'll say stuff like, I've been a good father, I've, I'm fair, I'm honest, I'm a good, I'm a good uh, dad, mom, whatever. You use all these phrases, he's good, but ultimately what they're trying to say is, I mean, ultimately my life, I'm a good person. And so I think that, you know, that I'm, I'm gonna get in based on that. Now, I find this interesting for this reason just go with me here for just a second because I, I believe that we always are able to be a good person because all I have to really do is be better than somebody else. You know, I'll give you an example. It'd be like, you're gossiping. I confront you on it. Dude, you're a gossiper. What are you doing? Cut it out. You know how people are. They're like, okay. Yeah, I was saying stuff, but it's not like I'm a liar. And then you go to the liar and you say, dude, you're a liar. I mean, you lie all the time. And they're like, listen, relax, Jack. I'm not a thief. You go to the thief and you're like, dude, you are a thief. You're like stealing all the time. And they go, well, I ain't killed nobody. You go to the murderer and you're like, dude, you whack somebody. I mean, you just took them on out. And I was like, listen, it's not like I killed a bunch of people. You go to the person who killed a lot of people. <laughs> you killed a lot of people. <laughs> There's ways that I would tell this joke based on the audience, but I'm gonna be careful here. So, cause there's a funny way to say this, but I'm not gonna do it. So you, you go to the person who's killed a lot of people. So you killed a lot of people. Oh, well, not Jeffrey Dahmer, <laughs> right? And that's where it could be funny because I could have said something else, but I won't. I'll let you imagine it yourself. 
You go to Jeffrey Dahmer, you're like, dude, holy cow. I mean, not only have you killed a lot of people, but, <laughs> and he looks at you and he goes, well, I'm not Hitler. <laughs> so then you go to Hitler. I know we're getting really dark here. <laughs> you go to Hitler and you're like, Hitler, you're, well, you can't really go to Hitler because he's the only one that we all agree. He's in hell. I mean, you know, we all are on the same page on this one. It doesn't matter what group you're in. We say, no, he's the bad one. That's the standard. And so what I'm trying to say is, it's subjective. And as long as you're not Hitler, you're good, right? I mean, that's the mentality when you think about it. It doesn't really matter. All I've got to do is find one person that I'm better than, and that's not going to be hard to do. Why? Because good is subjective. So what, all I have to do is just subjectively say, well, that's worse than this, and then we're pretty good. The idea that good people goes to heaven, I mean, I could see where it comes from. It's baked into cultures, baked into everything that we do. It makes sense. I mean, you think about it. Your kid does well. He said, you did a great job. If they do something bad, they get in trouble, right? And if you're good, you get promoted. If you're good at your job, you get promoted. And we all say together, that's fair. I mean, that makes sense. 87% of people who believe in heaven believe they're going to heaven. I mean, because they have this sense of fairness that really seems to make sense. So that's, that's where we land. So, but there's three problems, I think, with good people going to heaven. Three seriously important problems that you look at. Number one, who defines what is good? Who's going to define it? Because listen, how can, we, how can we be good when good is subjective? When I, we don't even know what the definition is for good. There's no clear standard. Nobody can make the list and we all go, yeah, we agree on the list. It's so subjective. There's no way to define it. We're all arguing over what is good. You think about it, religions, we, we don't agree on what is good. We're having debates on what this religion believes, what that religion believes. We're all struggling over what is good. And if I can't define it, how do I mark my progress? How do I know if I'm there? How do I know? I, you know what I'm saying? It's just a weird system. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, you know, as a, as a Christian, let me go ahead and tell you what many of us think our standard is. We think that the standard is the 10 commandments. And if you're a really good Christian, you understand that what they did in the Old Testament was they realized you can't meet those 10 commandments, not possible. So you know what they did? They created 637 other rules to make sure we never did the 10. This is gonna be, this is gonna be tough for some of you. Let me just let you in on a secret. The standard is too high, you can't meet it. If you die and you're a Christian and you're standing before God and he says, why should I let you in? Don't bring up those 10 commandments. Cause you're in trouble. All of you, it's just not good. You can't meet it. We don't agree on what the system is. You think about it. We, over time, these beliefs shift. We differ. We can't agree on sex. We can't, which by the way, I got shafted in this deal usually. Usually it's like, Chris, we're going to give you the hard one. You talk about hell. And I'm like, this time we were sitting down, we're having a conversation uh, about doing these series and who's going to do what. And, I was, and then I'm like, okay. And, and they're going through the list and sexuality was on there. And I said, nah, uh-uh. Listen, I get shafted every time I take the hard ones. I'm not taking that one. Listen, I'm so committed to not take that one. I'm talking about hell. And that's a hard one. But I ain't took today's day. Woo! Good luck, Nate. Hey, listen, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be sitting on the front row next Sunday is all I'm trying to say. I, I, mm, mm, mm. Good luck, Nate. Um, we can't agree on sex. We can't agree on civil rights. I mean, how do you not disagree? I mean, how, you know, you know, we can't even, it's crazy. Marijuana now, you know, we can't agree on marijuana now. It, raising your kids, 
massive disagreement. Marriage, divorce, how all that looks, massive disagreement. And I'm just going to give you this one too, because I let me give you a crazy one. Did you know that we can't even agree on coffee? You think I'm kidding. Did you know that there are some people who believe if you drink coffee, that it will impact your eternity? Now, I only bring this up to make this point. I have no idea if that's true or not. But here's what I do know. If I don't drink coffee in the morning, you're going to feel like you've been in hell. <laughs> that's all I'm trying to say. That's all I'm saying right there. That was just free, but it's true. It's true. <laughs> Seriously, you should not be able, listen, you should be able to know what the standard is. If all good people make it, then why is nobody telling me what the standard is? Now, I got a second problem. Let's just imagine for a moment that somehow we all came together and we actually created the list. Here's good, here's bad, here's the list. We finally got the standard. There you go, people. There's another problem. How good is good enough? You ever thought about this? I mean, think about this, think about this, think about this. I, I played basketball and I was good. I mean, I was good. But I never hit all of the shots. I mean, maybe nine out of 10, but not 10 out of 10, right? Would you agree with me in life at your best? We all, the one thing we can agree on is we're not perfect. We've not gotten it right every single time. We've made poor choices. We made bad decisions. That's, so how in the world are we going to know what's good enough, right? Did, so here's the thing. What's the percentage of goodness that's going to get me in? Is it 90%? 95%? Is it 50%? Is it 60? I mean, give me the number now because now I know what the standard is, but now I need to know the number. They're very important. This is probably for me the most important. When do we start measuring? What age is what I'm trying to say because I'm feeling like somewhere around after college would be really good for me personally. That's all, all, I'm, trying, that's all I'm trying to tell you people is if we could just start measuring after college, I... Okay, I don't have a chance, but I'd have a better chance because those were some rough days, is all I'm saying. Anybody else feel that? Anybody else? Please, Lord, after college, please, Lord Jesus. Can you offset some of the bad with good, which goes back to that last one? Because if it's before college, nah, there's three lifetimes I couldn't get that fixed. But after college, okay, probably still not going to happen, but there's a, there's a chance. So how many goods do I have to do to offset a bad, right? Can you offset this bad boy? Are some goods graded higher than other goods? And some bads worse than other bads? Do you see the complexity of the problem? I mean... <clears throat> Here's what we're talking about. If we're talking about good people going to heaven, it's sort of like this. It's like going to school and you're sitting in a classroom and the teacher looks at you and they say, hey, at the end of the semester, you're gonna have a test. Okay. And that test, it's pass or fail, right? Completely. Okay. Well, what, what's the test gonna be on? You got to figure that out on your own. I mean, well, what book should I read to get ready for it? I don't know. Figure it out on your own. How long is the test going to be? Mm -hmm. When's the test going to happen? I don't know. I mean, that's what we're talking about. I'm giving you no standard. I'm not telling you how we're going to grade it. I'm not telling you when it's going to happen. I'm just saying this is what's going to happen. It's not fair. We'd all agree with it. If I go to a job and your boss says the same thing at the end of a year, I'm going to evaluate you on your performance. I'm going to give you 14 or 15 different job descriptions. You got to figure out which one's yours. You got to figure out how to do it because I'm not going to tell you how to do it. And then I'm going to just let you figure it out when to do it. I'm not even going to tell you when your evaluation is. 
Same thing for a race. You show up at a race and they say there's no map. There's no course laid out. You just got to go and whoever gets to the end first gets it. All of these things don't make sense. It only begs the question, how in the world were you ever going to figure out what the standard is and how good you got to be at that standard to make it? And listen, if that's not bad enough, if that whole two problems isn't enough for you, what's good? How do we then evaluate good, what goodness looks like in the measuring stick? Here's the worst one. If we embrace this system that good people go to heaven, please know this, Jesus is a liar. I bet you never seen that on a screen before. <laughs> She's like, I'm not gonna push that up there. I'm not putting that on the screen. So she gave me a button. I had to push it myself because she wouldn't have put it up there. Jesus, and here's why. The, the, the whole thing is when you look at Jesus's life, everything about his life does, is, speaks contrary to this whole concept that good people go to heaven. The life of Jesus, his message, everything works against it. Listen, whether or not you believe in Jesus is not relevant, but let me be clear about this. If you conclude that good people go to heaven, Jesus is not an option. He's not on the table because he's a liar because he does not say that. Oh, it gets worse. I'm going to put another one up. This one on the screen is going to be even more painful. Some of you are going to have a heart attack. I'm going to get run out right here. You ready? Jesus taught that bad people go to heaven and that good people don't. You're crazy, Chris. What are you doing here? Christianity, I don't know if you know this, is the only religion that actually teaches this. So you think about the Pharisees, Sadducees, all these religious leaders back in the day. They're, let me tell you what their job was. They wake up every day. Their whole life is to know the law and God's word. Their job is to learn it, to understand it, every nuance of it, and then to live it out, to practice it better than anybody else, and then tell other people, and even stand in the gap for other people. That's their job. You know what Jesus said about them? You're a bunch of brood of vipers, the worst of the worst, whitewashed tombs. So the good, listen, if you're a Pharisee, I mean, come on. How, how would they not make it in? And the best, con, you know, the best contrast to, to a Pharisee in today's term is church people. I'll just let you struggle with that. I'm just saying, Jesus ruled them out. I think we understand that nobody's perfect, not even those guys. They made mistakes, right? One of the key texts of all scriptures, Romans chapter three, verse 23, that says, and I hope we all agree with this, is that we've all have sinned. We've all messed up. Now it takes a step further because it says not only have we all have sinned, but we've all fallen short of God's glory. So what the Bible basically has done and what it's setting up is that the measuring stick for goodness is God himself in the person of Jesus. He is who is holy. He is who is per He is perfect. The reason that we've fallen short is, is that we don't look like him and we don't measure up to him. He's perfect. And if he's the measuring stick and, and he's like a mirror that we're standing in front of, it should be easy for us to conclude is, hey, I'm not good in and of myself, when I look at it, and that's the measuring stick, I don't line up to that, no matter what standard you use. So here's the thing. What the Bible is teaching us is that we don't need a second chance. What we need is a savior. We need someone to come and rescue us and, and to make us good because we can't do it. No, no matter what effort we use, we'll never reach that standard. That's why let's go back to our text. John chapter three and verse 17, the verse after the famous text says this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So he's not coming in to condemn us. Why? But in order that the world might be saved through him. He didn't come to condemn us. He come to 
save us. In John chapter 14, verse six, Jesus himself says this. He says, hey guys, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus then puts out this supposition that if you're going to get in, you've got to come through me. I am a door. I am the passageway. I am the way. So therefore, if there's a different way, if there's many ways, if there is good people going to heaven and no need for him, then he is certainly a liar, right? And he's not the way and he's not the plan. But if he is telling the truth, then he's the path. So who gets in? So who gets in? Luke chapter 23, an interesting story. When you have Jesus being crucified, he's on the cross, right? You got these two guys that we would all agree are bad people. These are criminals. And whether or not they deserve death, certainly worth debate for other people. But nonetheless, he's on the cross. They're there. The one guy starts running his mouth. He's saying some stuff. The other guy, he, he then interjects into the conversation and basically tells the other guy, hey, look, dude, shut up. We both are some really bad people. We deserve this. But this guy's not done anything. They're, they're killing a, an innocent guy. And then he looks at Jesus. He said, will you remember me? Now, what should have been said if good people go to heaven is, no, dude, no way you're going. <laughs> listen, you are definitely, listen, this is not a debatable issue. You should die and you're not gonna be in heaven with me today. The crazy thing is when he looked at the Pharisees, he calls them one thing. When he looks at the guy who's on this cross next to him, humbles himself, asks for forgiveness. Jesus says, basically forgives him and says, this day you will be with me in paradise. Bad people go to heaven, not good people. Christianity, it isn't about what you do because what, what I can do is never going to be good enough. It's purely based on what Christ has done on your behalf because he is the embodiment of what is good. Everything that is good, his goodness, it's him dying for us to share with us what we couldn't do on our own. His death that makes us perfect. It's his goodness that we embrace. It is him who extends forgiveness, which is what? we need. So the question is, what do I need to do? I mean, who, what do I need to know? What, what, why does this matter? Here's what you need to know. Forgiven people go to heaven, not good people. Forgiveness comes from Jesus. He is the only one who can pay our sin debt. Let's go back to that famous text. John chapter three, verse 16. God, for God, so What? Love the world. He loves us immensely that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Listen, I don't know if you know this, but Christianity is the most just system in the world. Just based on this text that we just saw, it basically says this, everybody is welcome. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, that's who. It doesn't judge it. Listen, everybody gets in the same way. Anybody can get in. Doesn't matter what race, which person, what gender. None of that matters to him. We all can get in. Everybody can meet the requirement. It doesn't mean that we will, but we can. He's, he's not created an insurmountable hurdle. We make the hurdle big. God's saying, hey, come to me. Here I am. Why? Because forgiven people go to heaven, not good people. Listen, my um, years ago, we were having this huge event and I don't know how many of you guys have lost a kid before. You ever lost a kid like in a, a store or somewhere in an event? Crazy, right? That whole, you remember that feeling when it happened, your whole heart drops, you're like, oh my gosh, I wanna die. So that's level one. That first two or three minutes, that's that level one. You're like, Ooh, you know, your whole world starts to come apart. So we're at this big event 
it's a citywide event in downtown Rock Hill that we were a part of and we were putting it on and, and all of a sudden um, the event was over, we're tearing everything down, people have left, there's a smaller group of people hanging around and we're tearing everything down. And I had that moment when you start looking around and going, one of my kids is missing. You know, there was a baby and Holly had the baby and but Christian wasn't there. And I'm looking around going, hey, anybody seen Christian? Like, no. And you look, I mean, it, we're all in this like area where you could see everything. I'm like, oh, that's really weird. Hey, have you seen, and I asked Holly, have you seen him? Then you know how you do, you had that moment, your heart sinks. Cause this was a big event. So there's a lot of people there. And I didn't remember the last time I saw him. And so that whole thing of, oh my gosh. And so we start to look around and as several minutes goes by, that's what we call level one. Level one, you got the first several minutes, you're in that panic mode. But then normally most of us, that's when we find them, we go, whew, we passed level one. We're now into level two, five minutes goes by, 10 minutes now. And we're in pure panic. Holly's having a heart attack. We're now gathering people around and coming up with a search party, seriously. Everybody's come together, let's spread out. We've stopped everything, call the police. We gotta get on this right now. You know, that time, you remember, you watch all those terrible movies. That's the moment, you know, I wish I'd never seen a stupid movie like that in my life. Uh, Adam Walsh, I mean, popping up in my head. Every bad thing that you can imagine, your heart's falling apart. Everything's terrible, right? So now we're in full search mode and we're starting to span out over this whole area. And after about 15 minutes, out the door of the uh, city building, comes the guy uh, who works at the city building, who was part of our team, who's bringing my son out. And I'm like, oh, you found him. He goes, what's going on? <laughs> he didn't even know. He said, oh, he had to go to the bathroom and the only one that I could find was in the building that was locked up and I took him in. He starts going this. And so we had panicked that whole time and he was the only, he just, you know, I don't know if you know this, if he takes somebody's kid, you should let them know. I don't know, <laughs> just that's free. I'm gonna give that as a gift to you today. Um, small children, let their parents know. Uh, Cause they care most of the time. Um, and so that, that, you know, you had that moment, that relief and you're like, you know, you're just dying. You don't even care anymore. You know, Chuck's a hero, even though he's a, uh, almost, you know, caused you to have a heart attack. And I say all this for this reason. I want you to get this. This is what's important. This is the heart of God. I think that what we forget so many times is we think that God is letting us go to hell, that God is sending us to hell. No, the picture is just like this. He loves you. He loves you. His desire is for you. He is chasing after you. He sent his son down here for you. And listen, we don't understand it because we can't understand the mind of God and how it works that he could possibly love that many people. Listen, he knows you personally, and you matter to him. He is searching for you like me searching for my child. That's how important it was. And I think once we get this imagery and beginning to understand that God loves us and understanding that's pretty important. Now I'm gonna put our big question up one more time on the screen. And it says this, how could a loving God send good people to hell? It would be unfair for me not to mention briefly the whole hell thing um, and just put it in perspective. Once we understand, this is my theory. <clears throat> Once we understand that we're not good people, it should alleviate a little bit the whole issue of hell because it begins to understand, okay, I understand that I deserve something different. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's what I'm gonna get. So what is hell? I don't have time. It's a whole nother sermon that I'm not gonna do right now. What I would say is, and plus it's, it's highly debated highly debated about the details and the specifics, but here's something that's kind of agreed upon in general by most theologians. When you die, you would agree with me that you, you're separated from life. You are alive, no longer alive, separated from life. Revelation speaks of what is called a second death. There'll be a judgment and then there will be a separation from life again. In other words, hell is when you see God, you know who he is, you're now understand the concept, and then you're separated from him. Now, not because God did that, it's because you're choosing that. Isn't, God doesn't want you to be separated from him. He wants you with him. He, he's your, his child. But we say, no, I, I don't. I don't want you. Let's go back to our text. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned what? 
already. Because he's not believed in the name of this only son of God. And this is the judgment. And I mean, let me just say this, that even the only son of God, the whole thing is, is imagine you have no interest in Jesus. You have no interest in God. Why would you want to spend eternity with him? Because that is all it will be. It's him, his glory, his rule, his reign with him forever. So it's not, again, I think we have this misconception like, oh, God is just going to try to punish everybody. No, he, I want you and my family. Come hang out. This is, this is it. And we're going, nah, I don't want it. And then we get there, okay, I changed my mind. You know, that's, that's basically the thinking. Second part, verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved what? The darkness rather than the light because what? Their works were evil. And again, all of us have that in us and we're breaking out of that. So Basically, God is inviting you into this relationship. He wants a relationship with you. The answer is this person. It's in Jesus. He says, I am the way. I know it's crazy. And listen, I'm just hoping today that some of you will at least begin to have the conversation again. If this is a struggle for you that, hey, I'm gonna dig a little deeper. I'm gonna look. Why? Because it is urgent. It is important. I think in this day and time, we're so careful about our words because we don't wanna offend people. And I get it. I don't wanna offend people. And let me make this clear. Our job as believers is not to go out and offend on purpose. Our job is not to go out and force Ourself own other people. I'm not asking you to be a crazy evangelist going out demanding changes in laws and stuff to reflect what you believe. What I'm asking you to do is to live out what you believe. That's all I'm saying. And people can make their own decisions of whether or not they want to hang out with Jesus or not. It's okay. You can't force it on them. It's not possible. This is a choice that we make. And listen, it's a tough one for some people. I get it. And I'm not going to force you to do it. This is something you have to struggle with. And the, the choice ultimately is this, what you need to do if you're in this position, you're saying, okay, man, I get it. I need to take this step. I understand where you're at. What he's saying is, is the step is put your trust in Jesus. You're trusting something, something out there you're holding on to. I don't know what it is, but what God keeps saying is we let that go. Will you let that go and trust me? Because none of those things will make you good enough. None of those things will bring you full joy in life. No matter what you're aspiring to, it all fails. Listen, I hit 52 last week. It's unbelievable. I remember as a kid and you got, and every young person in here is going, oh my God, the old, com the old man comments. Listen to me, when I was younger, how do you guys remember when your parents or your grandparents would say stuff like, man, it goes so fast. Do y'all remember that? It's like, man, it was just like yesterday. It's so fast. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I'm waiting to get, I, school can't go fast enough, <laughs> you know? And then you hit 52 and I was like, whew, it went fast. It was a lot faster than I realized. I didn't think it would be. Whoa, it's like a jet plane. It's already here. Cause now, you know, at this age at 52, you're going, I see the end zone. I mean, it's like right around the corner. <laughs> now, so we don't like talking about it, but it's real. The reality is, would we all agree, even young people, if you think about it, it's short. It's a short period of time. And we don't live for this moment. We live for something greater, but for some reason, we're chasing it like it's the only thing out there while neglecting what's the most important thing out there. Just putting it, back in perspective. Put your trust in Jesus today, this morning. I just want to pray over you. I want you to think about a couple of things. One, if this is something new and you're struggling over this question and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, ultimately, I don't know what this all is here, but I don't know if it's me. It's just electrifying. You know, a good Baptist preacher would say, that's the devil. It's the devil getting in that sound system right there in that little audio pack. He's trying to stop people from hearing the word. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have heard that before. <laughs> no, it's just a, a short probably in the little connection right here is probably what it is. It's not the devil. Although <laughs> I've seen stranger things. So two things, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus, obviously that's the place to start. And if you're not ready, cool. We won't have conversations with you. If you are a believer, 
I'm asking you, will you put your trust in Jesus? And I say that because I feel like we've lost the urgency, uh, the urgency that hell is real and it's important that we let people know. And again, going back to, I'm not telling you to go out and act like a weirdo, carry around a sign and a pitchfork and all this stuff, scaring people to death, because that doesn't work. What I am saying is you start living differently so that people see what's real inside of you and they begin to ask questions and they explore faith at their own level and make their own decisions about who Jesus is. That's what I'm saying. We take our faith seriously. It's not just something we go do, it's something that we live. Does that make sense? I'm gonna pray over this. Just take time, bow your heads. I'm gonna do something a little crazy. I'm gonna ask you just to take a moment and I want you to pray. And for those of you that are believers, this shouldn't be hard. Begin to ask God what your next step is. What does it look like to trust him more? For those of you that have never placed your faith in Jesus, that this is all new for you, here's what I want you to do. Maybe today it's the first day that you cry out to God, that you ask, and I say cry out, maybe it's just ask him a question. Ask him to begin to reveal to you, to speak to you. Listen, I've heard this so many times, people are like, I wanna believe, but there's just something in the way. Well, here's what I'm telling you. Would you ask God right now, God, help me to believe. Help show me the path to faith. Talk to him. You don't have to be an expert. There are no rules. If today you want to cross that line, let me, let me just tell you this. Placing your faith in Christ is this. It is just confessing to him, hey God, I know I'm a sinner. Will you forgive me? And here's the big one. It's more than words, it's actions. Cause this isn't a moment, this is a movement. This is not a momentary thing, it's a daily thing. So God, I'm giving you my life, not this moment, I'm giving you all of it. Are you willing to make that statement? It doesn't matter how you say it. There's no magic in the words, it's him coming into your life. But if I was praying it, it would be something like this. It'd be God, I have absolutely failed you. I recognize that I'm not good enough and you are. You are the standard that I, in and of myself, I can't reach. And God, I'm gonna trust in Jesus, his death. I'm the guy on the cross next to him. Will you remember me today? As I give you my life. Father, move in this room. Help us to be bold about our faith. Help us to trust you with more than just words, God, more than just a, a day of the week. God, may we trust you with our life. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.